Hi, I'm Gay Crager. Today I'd like to show you some techniques to help simplify drawing in the great outdoors. I will be using the same trusty tools as last week, the Strathmore 400 series journals or the Strathmore 200 series skills watercolor paper, the permanent pen, pencils, and brushes. But I will sneak in a few new tools throughout the lesson. My goal today is to teach you how to make a drawing that represents what you see, outside and inside. I will use a few different techniques to show you how to draw what is in front of you rather than what you think you see. But before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about perception and how we perceive this great world out here. When we draw anywhere, we have to overcome our preconceived ideas. We all know adult human heads are about the same size. Like, my head is about the same size as your head. The reason I'm using human heads as an example is because we're so familiar with them. They can show us how strong our preconceived notions are. So, back to the heads. If we were to draw them, we would make them the same size, right? But what if they are further away? Do they look different? They do. But sometimes it is hard to convince the logical side of your brain of this. This exercise can help convince a skeptical brain that human heads are not all the same size. Roll up a piece of paper. Look through it at someone close to you until their head fills the tube. Then look at someone further away. Even though, logically, we know these heads are about the same size, they look smaller. What about a table? Our logical brain tells us it's flat, right? So if we draw it, we have to make it flat. But the top of the table changes the way it looks, depending on where we are looking at it from. If my eye level was right at the edge of the table, it would be a straight line. But as my eye moves up, things change. We are no longer seeing something horizontal or flat, but something made up of angles. So we have to learn to let go of these preconceived notions and concentrate on just what we are seeing, not what we think we are seeing. Now that we know we have to take what our logical brain says with a grain of salt, we can move on to capturing what is out there in our world. One of the tools to help us judge size and angle comparison outside is a viewfinder. It can help us transfer what we see in the 3D world to a flat 2D piece of paper. I'm cutting this one out of one of my watercolor pages. I am making it in the same proportion, approximately, as the paper I am drawing on. Once I have made my viewfinder, I can use the wide angle feature or the zoom feature and I can use it either horizontally or vertically. I can use it to crop out some of the information bombarding me out here in the real world and it helps me decide what I want to focus on to draw. I need to close one eye to use this tool. It removes my depth perception. This makes what I see through the viewfinder two-dimensional. This is the picture plane. I need to transfer the information I see through here to my paper. The viewfinder will help me see the size relationships of what I am looking at. If I am drawing a table, I can compare the angles of the table to the verticals and horizontals of my viewfinder. Then I'll transfer this information to my paper. I'll start by drawing a box the same proportion as my viewfinder, and then I'll start adding the angles as I see them in relationship to the verticals and the horizontals that I've drawn. I'll add the bottom parts of the table and the leg right in the middle, pretty much, and I will have gotten the information I saw on the picture plane of my viewfinder transferred to my journal. I'll draw another page, this time focusing on relationships rather than angles. I'll start drawing the bowl of my fountain, noting where it starts and stops against the edge of my viewfinder. 
and I'll make another little note where the joint of the base is. Fill in those lines and then down at the very bottom another uh, semicircle there. I'll add the lion on the fountain. Noting where it comes and what things are in relationship to it. I start drawing the large bowl of the fountain, noting the relationships of where it starts and stops. Add the edge of the fountain, noting that it does come right under the, the lion's head. And now I'm looking to find out where the line for the uh, back edge of the vegetable garden starts. And I'm going to just take out that wooden box that's there. It's ugly. It serves a purpose, but um, I'm adding my foliage and my flowers, and I drew the pot with the mint in it, and uh, some few more flowers. I'll add the water. There's no water in the lower bowl because there's a big crack in it, a crack you can't actually see. But I'll draw a crack anyway. I drew these viewfinder drawings in ink so that you could see them, but you could easily draw them in pencil, and then you could erase any mistakes that you made while drawing them. Is there another way to do this? Remember that picture plane? Well, what if you could draw directly on it? I'm looking through the studio window at the fountain, and I'm going to draw <coughs> directly on the window. I'm using a wet erase pen so that I can clean the window when I'm finished, but I'm just tracing what I see through the window directly onto the glass. I have one eye closed to remove my depth perception, but I'm also noticing when I do this, I'm noticing my relationships, like where does that upright post hit the fountain top? And, and where is the, um, the edge of the foliage in relationship to the path that comes to the studio. When I'm finished, I will transfer the information to my journal page by holding it up over my window drawing, and then I'll trace the lines. But now I'm using a permanent pen because I'll want to cover this with watercolor, so I don't want it to bleed like a wet erase pen would. I certainly could use a pencil if, uh, if I wanted not to have the ink lines. It's much easier to draw with it not up against the window. I will finish this off and I'll watercolor it later. It was pretty easy to draw on the window, but there's not always a window where you need it. So what should one do in that case? Well, you can take the window with you, a portable window. This is a piece of plastic I had cut the size of my journal. Again, you want to remember to use the wet erase pen on your plastic. One of the difficult things about this technique is finding a way to support your portable window while you're drawing on it. I'll use the edge of the fountain I need to make sure I close one eye as I look through my, my plastic. And I'm drawing just what I'm seeing, just like I did when I was drawing through the window. You can't quite see it as easily because the camera can't be right where my eye is. My drawing won't be perfect, but this technique does allow me to capture what I am seeing in the garden. A few last details and then I will be ready to transfer it to my journal page. And I'll do that by holding it up to the window. You could use a light table, but windows are pretty handy and common around the house. And I'll trace it with my permanent pen. You could use pencil, but you don't want to use your wet erase pen. When I get my lines transferred, I'll take it off the window and work a little bit more on it on a flat surface. Again, it's much easier to draw with the, with the journal flat. 
I'm going to touch up my picket fence a little bit and work a little on my tomato cages. This is certainly not a perfect drawing. I didn't get every detail down on that plastic. Holding the plastic while you are drawing with one eye closed is not easy, but it does really help us to see the relationships of the trees in the background to what is in the foreground. My logical brain knows that a tree is taller than a tomato cage, but by using my plastic, I can see that in this case, the tomato cage is taller than the apple trees behind it. After touching up some of my ink lines with a darker permanent pen, I'm finished and ready to start painting. I'll fill my water brush at the kitchen sink. I unscrew the brush part and squeeze the barrel under running water. Another way to fill my brush is to squeeze where it says push and then dip it upside down in the water and release and continue to squeeze and release until the barrel is full of water. And then once it's full I can screw the brush back on and I'm ready to go. I'm mixing up a uh, grayish sky color because today it is not sunny in California. I'm not worried about creating a perfect wash here, just filling in some blue and gray to represent the sky and I'm working quickly. Who cares if it's perfect? I'm filling in the large areas of color, the large light areas of color first, because I know I can go over them. So the sky and my uh, concrete path and my concrete block wall for my vegetable garden. I'll mix up some brown to paint my grape stake fence. I'll be able to paint the fence without uh, touching the wet sky or the foreground path. So I won't have to worry about any wet on wet accidents. After letting my sky path and fence dry, I'll mix up some green for my foliage. And I'm going to dilute it because it's my first layer of green. And when I paint my, my green here around my tomato cages, I'm going to let bits of the tomato cages stay white. At least I'm going to try and leave some of the tomato cages white. Since this is my first green layer, I'm going to leave it light and not worry too much about having it be perfect. Actually, not worry at all about having it be perfect to try and keep a little of the green off of my fence. But I know I can cover it up, and I will with more layers. So when I finish this, I'll let it dry. I've added a little more pigment to my uh, foreground greens here, my tomato plants. I think there's a pea in there somewhere too. Because I'm getting closer, my pigments can be a little more intense. While it's still good and wet, I'm dipping my brush into one of the blue pigments that'll add some soft dimension to my tomato plants. One way to tell if your paint is still wet is to tilt it, and if you see a shiny reflection on it, like the green over there, it is still wet. Another way is to gently touch it. After everything is dry, I'll add my third layer of greens in the background, still being careful to go around the fence. Slightly careful. I'm going to clean my brush by squeezing while I blot. And then I'll uh, mix a little of my brown with a little of the dark purpley blue to darken my brown to touch up my fence, my already dry area of fence. I'll warm up my brown with a little of the uh, orangey red and orangey yellow so I can paint my pot and my bricks. I'll make my brown darker for the dirt in the garden bed that doesn't have anything planted in it yet. After everything is dry, I'm going to clean out one of the wells in my palette so I can mix up a purple, one of my favorite colors for shadows. 
I'll use my purpley blue and mix it with my purpley red. And now that I know I can make purple, I'm so happy I have a beautiful purple. And I'll use that to come in and, and make some shadows under the trees in the orchard and a few other places where I see shadows. I think this page needs a little spatter. Let's try that. Oh, maybe not in the sky. I guess I should mask out the sky. It's a little harder to get the spatter to work with the water brush, so I'm using my finger to tap it against. Oh, here's a use for the cutout for my viewfinder. After all my spatter has dried, I'm going to add my shadows across the path, making them come up a little over the bricks. <clears throat> I'm going to now add a little darker uh, tree shadows. As I get further along in painting the page, the colors I use are more pigment dense. Less water, more pigment. These will be my final darks, so I'm using a lot of pigment and I've let my page dry completely. This is where I use that rich pigment. And last minute touches. I'll add some darker green around my tomato cages and my fence, and that will finish the painting for this journal page. The viewfinder, windows, and pieces of plastic are tools to help the logical left side of your brain let go of preconceived ideas of what things look like. After practicing with these tools for a while, your logical brain will take a back seat while you are drawing and you will find you need your tools less and less. I hope you enjoyed learning about these tools to take outside and draw. So don't worry about whether or not you create the perfect drawing. Go outside and enjoy yourself. Take your tools or draw without them. I am really looking forward to seeing what you create. Join me next week to see how I turn these drawings into journal pages. See you then.